A few weeks ago, I called out one of my modeling influences in Chris Walker, and today I'd like to call out another. Most of you would be familiar with the work of Andy Moore. Andy's work has always inspired and, to be honest, intimidated me a little, especially when building alongside him at the Modeling News. Andy's finishing and execution are nothing short of incredible, and if you haven't seen Andy's work, then do yourself a favour and take a look. The reason I've called Andy out today is I've always been inspired by the work he'd done on the recent release Meng Leopard 2 series and wanted to add my own modern cat to my collection. The Leopard 2 A7 Plus was essentially a modernised version of the 2 A6 and was debuted to the public at the Euro Satori Defence Industry Trade Fair in 2010. The primary focus of the A7 Plus was to be effective in urban operations and to be able to combat threats posed by IEDs and RPGs. The 120mm smoothbore L55 is the same gun as the 2A6, but the A7 Plus also features a remote controlled weapon station fitted with either a 50 cal or a grenade launcher. I've always been fascinated by digital camouflage schemes, so this seemed like the perfect opportunity to try something different and add something ultra-modern to the display case. Making these videos has meant that I've had to think about being as efficient as I can during these construction phases. So what I'm starting to do now is prepare and clean as many of the parts as I can before actually committing to glue. The wheel assemblies are in two halves with a polycap in the centre, which is great because it'll allow for movement in the wheel and it'll also allow the wheels to be removed for painting. With the two halves of the wheels together, a small cap is applied over the top and the wheel is now ready. The drive sockets and idlers soon follow. The instructions call out for a number of small holes to be pre-drilled in the hull and then one of the armour upgrades on the A7 Plus is added to the bottom of the hull. The various components for the suspension system are attached to the hull. Most of these elements will be difficult to detect once all of the parts are attached, however the detail was at a very high standard with some lovely refined weld seams. I was struggling to identify the letters on the sprues, so a quick tip here is to colour them in using a black sharpie. It's quick and simple and saved a lot of mucking around trying to identify the pile of sprues. Moving back to the hull and the housing for the drive is attached. Positioning is important, so be sure to align the small gaps as shown. The kit comes with a workable suspension and this is achieved by using a torsion bar system. But first the arms receive the armour upgrade over the top. It will be lost behind wheels but it is there nonetheless. The torsion bars are then fed through the hull and are seated in the opposite side of the hull. The flex in the plastic rod allows the suspension to move. It's a little sticky, but it does move a little, certainly enough to be able to pose your model on uneven terrain. Further armour upgrades to the underside of the hull are attached using a placement jig. A quick and easy solution that allows Meng to use the hull section from earlier releases. The rear wall of the hull contains a number of basic assemblies and was prepared and glued in place on the hull. Moving now to the tracks and Meng seem to have ticked the boxes in terms of build experience. The tracks are workable and before you all cringe at the thought of assembling lengths of track links, the assembly has been broken down into smaller lengths and comes together with the aid of a jig. Not only that, but the pins are pre-spaced on the sprues, so it's just a matter of placing the pieces in the jig and then connecting them all. By carefully applying the glue, I'm able to keep movement in the parts. 
It is then just a matter of connecting all the small sub-assemblies and making the longer lengths as required. The pin connectors are then removed and the track is complete. The top section of the track will be hidden behind layers of armour, so I only make the lengths long enough to show what I need. As mentioned previously, the A7 Plus saw upgrades in the armour around the vehicle, which in turn gives it its unique sci-fi like appearance. Construction moved to the upper part of the hull and the first slab of additional armour is glued in place. The engine deck is then glued in place and the armoured plate for the air intakes is also set in its position. The part comes as a poseable section, although with nothing to show on the inside of the model, that's a fairly redundant feature. How redundant. Thank you. The top and bottom sections of the hull are now connected and glued in place, which allowed me to get a better read on how the poseable hat should be sitting there within the parts. I noticed there was quite a significant sag through the deck which would have to be addressed. Rather than complicate the fix, all that would be required was a small piece of blue foam to be cut to size and wedged into the innards of the hull. I did this after the glue had had time to set so as not to stress all of the joins. The two large air intakes on the rear deck are instantly recognisable as being part of the Leopard 2 lineage. The kit comes with mesh screens to detail these sections. The etch is carefully removed from the fret using a sharp blade, with the small burrs left on the parts easily removed with a sanding stick. There is also mesh detail that needs to be fed around a couple of the moulded parts. Super glue is required to attach the etch to the plastic. The advantage of super glue is that it dries quickly, however that can be a curse at times also, but in this instance it allows me to work the etch detail around the part in small sections. Once in place, the parts are connected to the upper hull. The etch for the large intakes comes as a two-part assembly. Care is required not to warp the parts when removing them. A small amount of super glue is sparingly applied around the perimeter of the part and the etch is sat in place. The mesh detail is then stacked in place by using the same technique. I knew from the outset that the paint scheme I was planning on painting would take a lot of careful planning in order to execute it properly. The urban camouflage requires a lot of straight and tight geometric patterns. The flatter I could keep the model at this time of masking and painting, the more successful the foundation paintwork would be. I would planned to build the bare minimum of the model to cut down any lumps and bumps so things like the cables and the tools were left off at this point. I noted all of the elements I would need to readdress after the base colours were applied so I wouldn't forget about them when it came time to fit them. The bulky armour along the sides was also left off the hull assembly at this point to allow me reasonable access to the running gear as this would need to be pre-painted whilst I had access to it. I did however fit them using a blob of blue tack in order to give me a sense of the shape and scale of the model and help me with the build progress. The model has been on the agenda for some time now and like the majority of us armour modellers I started collecting aftermarket before I even had the kit. Upgrading a barrel is one of the first things I would usually do with my armour models, but after looking at the detail in the kit supplied part, I began to reassess the need to even use it. I have other kits in the stash the barrel would be suitable for, so I decided to go with the kit supplied offering. The two halves required a small amount of sanding and scraping, but the result was excellent and would fare well on the finished model. The clear periscopes are fed through the top of the turret and the two halves are then connected 
with the gun mount also encased in the two parts. Various assemblies are then attached to the turret section. However, I'm still mindful of building the bare minimum in order to make the masking that would follow a little more successful. The gun mount has a couple of poly caps that allow for movement in that part. So be sure not to glue the top flap in place if you still want to maintain movement in that part. Construction continues with the sub-assemblies at the rear of the turret. First up is the air conditioning unit, which makes for an interesting detail with the etched grills adding a really authentic touch. A couple of other storage boxes and units are attached to the rear deck. One of the iconic details of the late generation Leopard 2s is the science fiction look of the angled applique armour at the front of the turret. This is pre-assembled and glued in place at this time. The smoke launchers are a detail that adds a certain character to most modern tanks and the Leopard 2 is no exception. I did however feel there was an opportunity to detail this section a little further using styrene and soldering wire. I wanted to recreate this but first I needed to remove the mould seams and the small cap off the kit supplied parts. Once they'd been tidied up, they were glued in place along with the mounting bracket. 0.25mm solder wire is the perfect thickness to represent the wiring on the smoke launchers. It was first divided up into lengths and a small drop of superglue is used to hold the wire in place. With the wire attached to all of the launchers, I was then able to go back and feed the wire to the underside of the part and trim it to the appropriate length. To then recreate the small top cap on the part, I went straight for the punch and die set and a thin sheet of styrene. A 0.6mm section of the styrene is stamped out and glued in place to complete the detail that was removed during the cleaning of the part. The benefit of using the styrene is 1. It's easy to punch out and 2. I'm able to attach it using regular modelling cement to give it a strong bond. The remote controlled weapons station has its own cluster of smoke launchers, so the same treatment was included to help enhance those details. It is a simple upgrade that will add a great deal of finesse to the finished look of that part. There are also further opportunities to detail this section by adding wiring to the parts. Again, after studying reference as well as looking at Andy's build I mentioned earlier, I'm able to upgrade the assembly by first drilling some positioning holes and then feeding wiring around the parts. A combination of electrical wire and solder are used to create different looks to the assembly. Small lengths of lead foil are used to create a collar around the connection points of the wires as well as adding brackets to enhance the look of the details. A quick undercoat with Mr. Surfacer Black 1000 to unite the various types of media will ensure the subsequent layers of paint will adhere properly. With the primer still in the airbrush, I painted the smoke launches and along the sides of the turret as an insurance policy. Access will be difficult once the additional armour sections are attached, so painting these parts black now will ensure against any unwanted plastic showing through on the finished paint job. The turret is then further bulked up with the application of the spaced side armour sections. The space between the armour and the body of the turret is then enclosed with a series of hatches and covers, giving the part the look of a continuous shape. And I'd somehow forgotten my commitment to the black background in this build series, but that aside, I set about masking the clear sections of the periscopes with small pieces of masking tape. 
Maintaining the clear part is optimal, although not always possible. But I wanted to try something with these periscopes so they were prepared for paint. One thing I'd neglected to do was remove the moulded grab handles around the hull. I'll replace them at a later date with a section of copper wire, but by removing them at this stage it will help give me a flatter surface to work with for the masking project. The hole positions were drilled at this stage using the marks from where the moulded versions were removed. This will give me the locating points once the base layer of paintwork is masked and sprayed in place. Time to start the paintwork and I move back to the wheels. The wheels are prepared by fitting them off to toothpicks using a small piece of blue tack. The rubber sections of the road wheels are then painted into me a rubber black. The toothpick makes this a simple process of just rotating the stick to ensure a good coverage. The return rollers are stuck to a piece of tape and receive the same treatment. I get a lot of people asking about this spraying template and to answer the question it is a royal model product although I'm not sure how easy they are to find anymore but it makes painting road wheels a quick and easy process. It's a matter of selecting the appropriate diameter hole, preparing the surrounding cavities and painting through that section. A lightened mix of desert yellow is the colour used for the insides of the wheels. With the yellow mix still in the airbrush, the underside of the hull was painted at this stage also. Access will be obstructed once the model is assembled, so I have had to address the running gear now rather than later. With the paint dry, a wash using shadow brown oil paint thinned with the VMS oil enhancer is applied to the nooks and crannies around the shapes of the hull. Again, this is all about access at this point, and most of this work I'm doing at the moment will be hidden behind tracks and wheels. With the wash set, I could now apply the road wheels and look to attach the tracks. A mix of dark iron and red brown are applied to the track sections. Given I was making a pretty well maintained, more or less prototype vehicle, I wanted to ensure the tracks looked reasonably new and I didn't want to represent them with rusty tones through them. The iron with a touch of the red brown seemed to fit the bill. Once the undercoat had time to dry, I now needed to address the rubber pads on the tracks. I'd initially considered painting these in a dark grey colour to represent the rubber, but there wasn't enough contrast between that and the iron colour. I found the quickest way to differentiate these parts was to dry brush the sections using basalt grey from AK Gen 3 range of acrylics. It was hard to see the result, but comparing the treated versus the non-treated tracks, it was actually quite obvious. The tracks were then flipped and masked along the edges and a citadel paint by the name of Lead Belcher was used in a semi dry brush motion to help create the look of the track being polished by the wheel passing over it. Once the tape is removed the effect can be seen. Because I'd only assembled half lengths of the tracks, I needed to attach them to the underside of the hull. The easiest way to do that is by using a small piece of double sided foam tape. The small tab is attached to the model and the track can then be fed around the idler and stuck to the tape. The backside is a little trickier because tension is required across the length prior to committing to sticking it down, so a little patience is required, but certainly nothing too complicated. The tape worked a treat and saved me having to build the entire length of the tracks. It's only attached with duct tape! 
The Leopard 2 has a number of optics around the body of the vehicle and whilst the instructions call them out to be painted in a clear blue, I chose to follow Andy's path here again and paint them in a clear red. First though I had to mask out the sections of the clear parts using VMS masking fluid. The masking fluid is brush painted in the moulded sections of the clear parts. The masking fluid dries very quickly and the part can then be painted in the clear red. I sprayed the back side of the part as well as the periscopes I had masked up using tape in the earlier stages of the video. It's my hope that the clear red will refract the light and give me a convincing look to these sections. The front side of the parts that have had the masking fluid are then painted in a NATO green. A short time after I'm then able to remove the masking fluid to give me a look at the finished result. In hindsight, I should have left the mask on until later, but impatience got the better of me again. For the periscopes, I wanted to create a mirror look to them. A layer of SMS stainless steel is applied over the clear red in the hope that that will do the trick. Time will tell how successful that will actually be. I hadn't connected the driver's hatch at this point because something didn't seem right. After some investigation, it seems the instructions neglected the top and bottom rails that are required to hold that in place. And it's worth noting if you are building this model for yourself. With all of the sub-assemblies done, it was time to think about priming the model. I needed to ensure the wheels and tracks wouldn't be subject to overspray, so a basic mask was created using tape and the model was prepared for the priming phase. Priming the model in a Mr. Surfacer Grey 1000 will unify the etch, plastic and the various other elements around the model and ensure the subsequent layers of paint will adhere well. It also gives me a glimpse into any flaws or blemishes I may have missed during the construction phase. I've used the grey primer mainly because I had it available to me, plus the urban scheme I'm planning on doing has a lot of white in it and I didn't want to start from a black base. The last few builds I've undertaken have been quite the marathon, so I was looking forward to sinking my teeth into this Meng Leopard 2 and getting to the paintwork with a minimum of fuss. I must admit though, I have been surprised at the amount of time taken during the construction and paint preparation phase for such a simple kit. Granted, I spent some time on upgrading the smoke launchers and the weapon station, but I would have hoped I would have been painting the scheme before now. I always knew the Leopard 2 was a big tank, but looking at it on the bench, I'm still in shock at the size of the thing. The spaced and angled armor really take this version of the tank to a new level. I'm really excited at the prospect of getting the paint on this model and I can't wait to bring it to you in the next couple of weeks. Thanks again for tuning in, it is truly appreciated and if I've added some value today, please be sure to smash that like button and please subscribe if you haven't already. It's helping me reach a greater audience and grow this channel. Remember guys, this is the greatest hobby in the world. Share it with your family and share it with your friends and let's be proud of what we do. Until next time, I'll see you soon.